Hello everyone and welcome to a new topic in the myocardial ischemia as we are starting the topic of non-ST elevation acute coronary syndrome. Of course, we have finished our talk about STEMI in many lectures and today we are speaking with or starting with the non-ST elevation acute coronary syndrome including the unstable angina and non-STEMI. Our ILOs in this introductory lecture is to understand the value of ECG in the risk stratification and to understand the different ECG features in non-ST elevation acute coronary syndrome. And as we learned before, we are not going to discuss the management of non-ST elevation acute coronary syndrome in these lectures, as here we are speaking about the ECG itself. So the first thing is what is meant by this terminology non-ST elevation. Of course, we know that some patient presents with acute coronary syndrome. So he has two possibilities. The first possibility is that he has ST elevation, which would be considered as a STEMI, and we have spoken about this, or no ST elevation, and so it is called non-ST elevation. So I mentioned no ST elevation, which includes ST depression, tooth inversion, or include normal ECG. So non-ST elevation acute coronary syndrome, it means that there is no ST elevation and any other possibility could be accepted in the definition. So what are the clinical presentation of non-ST elevation acute coronary syndrome? It's acute chest discomfort in one of the following scenarios. The first one is prolonged chest discomfort at rest of more than 20 minutes. Another scenario is new onset angina, CCS class two or class three of less than three months. So new onset angina is considered to be as non-ST elevation acute coronary syndrome. Recent destabilization of previously stable angina with at least class 3 angina characteristics, which is called crescendo angina, as now the patient has just been on less exertion, so I expect that there is a new lesion or complicated lesion here in the coronaries, so it is considered acute coronary syndrome and post-MI angina. And you know, of course, CCS class stands for Canadian Cardiovascular Society classification is equivalent to the NEHA classification in the dyspnea and heart failure patients. In risk stratification of non-ST elevation, we depend on three more major items, clinical presentation, ECG, and troponin. We are focusing here, of course, on the ECG rather than the clinical presentation or the troponin because it is an ECG course. Of course, ECG is an essential, rapid, and easy way in risk prediction. First of all, what's the difference between unstable angina and non-STEMI? The only difference is in the cardiac marker. In unstable angina, there is normal cardiac marker due to absence of myocardial injury, and so it has better prognosis. Whereas in non STEMI, there is detection of acute rise and or fall of cardiac markers due to acute myocardial injury caused by ischemic etiology, and so it has worse prognosis than unstable angina. So both are considered non ST elevation, but non STEMI has worse prognosis due to the myocardial injury. A question that many of us ask himself is non STEMI less dangerous than STEMI? Inside the hostel course, the STEMI has higher mortality than non-STEMI. At one to, six mo one to six months follow up, they may have nearly equal mortality and prognosis, but one or year or more follow up, non-STEMI has worse prognosis and higher mortality on the long run. And up to 25% of patients presenting with non-STEMI have totally occluded vessel on angio. The most common is the RCAs and the LCX, and the least one in common is the LED, which is associated with increased mortality. And so, recognition of ECG pattern in the absence of ST elevation associated with such angiographic finding is very important clinically because some of these patients may have a poor prognosis. So, non ST is not only the safe diagnosis or just the stable diagnosis. No, sometimes the patient may have grave ECG features suggesting of total occlusion and need for urgent revascularization. In the fourth universal definition of myocardial infarctus, the ACG manifestations in conclusions that were suggestive of acute ischemia regarding STEMI or non-ST, that was the ST elevation, as we mentioned in its definition before, besides the ST depression and T wave changes, which is defined as new horizontal or down sloping ST depression more than or equal 0.5 mm in two contiguous leads, and or T wave inversion more than 1 mm in two contiguous leads with prominent R wave or R S ratio more than 1. So these are the collective ECG manifestations for myocardial ischemia. And in the 2020 EEC guidelines, of course, they mentioned that additional ECG leads regarding the right ECG leads and the posterior leads are recommended if ongoing ischemia is suspected because it may detect patient which should be regarded as a STEMI. And we mentioned this before, of course, in the lecture of STEMI and in the final lecture of the query ECGs for STEMI. If the clinical presentation ECG are not conclusive, we mentioned before that we need to compare with previous ECG and 
perform serial ECGs in order to detect whether there's dynamic change or not. So it is a rule that apply in STEMI or apply in non-ST if the clinical presentation and ECG both are not conclusive because we usually combine them together to make a decision. We need also to mention again and again the ECG in non-ST may be normal in more than 30%. Of course, the normal ECG has a better prognosis in comparison to abnormal ECG, but this does not exclude non-STEMI. The patient may have non-STEMI despite normal ECG. But if we need to mention what are the ECG abnormalities in non-ST, they include ST segment depression, TUAV changes, and transient ST elevation. Let's start with ST segment depression. We have three morphological variants of ST depression, which are the horizontal, downsloping, and upsloping ST depression, according to the direction of the ST segment starting from the J point. Of course, we know that the horizontal and downsloping ST depression are more clinically significant for myocardial ischemia than the upsloping. But please, this doesn't mean that to ignore upsloping ST depression. Yes, it is less clinically significant, but sometimes in a patient with chest pain, the only abnormal finding is the upsloping ST depression is suggestive of myocardial ischemia. In the fourth universal definition, as we mentioned, that the definition includes ST elevation and the ST depression and TUF changes in the guidelines of 2018. But in 2020 AC guidelines, they put criteria for ST segment depression, which may be seeming complicated, like a J point depressed by more than or equal 0.5 mm in V2 and V3, or more than 1 mm in other ECG leads, followed by horizontal or down sloping ST depression for more than 80 millisecond, which include two small squares in one or more lead except AVR. So the ACG criteria for the ST segment depression in the most recent guidelines includes the cutoff point of 0.5 mm in V2, V3 and cutoff point of 1 mm in the other leads and the duration of about two small square in one or more lead excluding AVR. Of course, these cutoff points apply in your clinical practice or you can apply them, but sometimes if a patient has convincing clinical presentation of myocardial ischemia, even if it is not fulfilling all these criteria at the time, you need to admit this patient and follow up the ECG because the serial ECG may show or may fulfill these criteria. In case of ST depression, we should comment on the magnitude of the ST depression or the depth in millimeter, the morphology, whether it is horizontal, upsloping or downsloping, and the distribution, including the number of leads involved. And of course, remember, the deeper the ST segment depression and the wider it spread, the worse the clinical prognosis of non-ST elevation acute coronary syndrome. And I quoted this paragraph from the guidelines, ST segment depression is not only a qualitative marker, but it is also a quantitative marker of risk because of the number of leads with ST depression and the magnitude are indicative of the extent of ischemia and of course of the prognosis. In this ECG, we can see ST depression in V2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, and also in the inferior leads. So it is suggestive of non-ST elevation acute coronary syndrome. Some of you may say that there is minimal ST elevation AVR, but not fulfilling the criteria to be considered as left main equivalent. In this ECG as well, we can see here that there is ST depression in V4, 5, and 6, and also slightly in the inferior leads suggestive of non-ST. And remember, please, before jumping to the diagnosis of non-ST based on the presence of ST depression ECG, make sure at first that it is not reciprocal depression to opposing C elevation or left main equivalent. For example, in this ECG, I can see here that the patient is having ST depression in lateral leads, but he has ST elevation in inferior leads, so this patient has inferior STEMI, it is not non-ST. Is inferior STEMI and this is a reciprocal depression in the lateral leads. Here we can say that the patient has ST depression in the inferior leads, but he has ST elevation lateral leads, so it is high lateral STEMI. In this ACG, we can see here that there is ST depression in V2 and V3, but we stole R wave and the R wave duration may be slightly prolonged. So, is it posterior STEMI? Yes, it is not non ST. Is posterior STEMI, and if you arrange for perform posterior ECG lead, it would show you an ST elevation of more than or equal 0.5 millimeter. In this ECG, I can see here that there is ST depression in the inferolateral leads. Yes, it is non ST? No, it is not non ST. We have frank ST elevation in AVR and V1. Of course, it is left main equivalent, and this patient should be considered or for or scheduled for urgent invasive coronary angiography and considered as STEMI.
Here in this ACG, we can see ST depression in V4, 5, and 6. But there is hyperacuity waves as well. Yes, it is not non ST. It is the winter syndrome. So this patient should be considered as anterior steny, not non ST elevation acute coronary syndrome. So we have spoken about the ST segment depression and its morphological variant and the precautions before commenting on them. Let's move to the T wave changes. In the 2020 AC guidelines for non ST, they mentioned that the evidence regarding the prognostic effect of the isolated tube inversion is conflicting and maybe less than the prognosis of the ST segment depression. And there is no correlation found in the study which analyzes the prognostic impact of T wave inversion in fewer leads. And most of these studies were focusing on T wave inversion in five or more leads. Of course, overall, the prognostic value of T wave inversion is certainly less than that of the T wave ST segment depression. But if it is the only abnormal finding, it should be respected. So give me the rules for the T wave. QRS and T wave tend to have the same direction in the limb leads. T wave must be upright in lead 1, 2, and from V2 to V6. T wave must be negative in AVR. T wave may start negative in V1, then turn positive in the rest of the chest leads. It seems familiar this information? Yes, from the lecture of ECG in the interpretation at the start of the course. Normal T wave is asymmetrical, slow ascending slope, rounded peak with rapid descending slope, and the asymmetry is more pronounced when the heart rate is slow. And so what are the abnormalities in T wave? It can be hyperacute, it can be biphasic, it can be inverted, and the inverted T wave can be symmetrical or asymmetrical. The hyperacute T wave, of course, is suggestive of STEMI, as we mentioned in the last lecture. So here we are focusing on the biphasic T wave and T wave inversion. Asymmetrical T wave usually occurs in strain pattern. So here we are more and more focusing on biphasic T wave and symmetrical T wave inversion in case of non ST acute coronary syndrome. Also in the 2020 guidelines, the criteria for the isolated T wave inversion was more than one millimeter inversion in five or more leads considering lead one, two, AVL, and from V2 to V6. This is the criteria for isolated T wave inversion to be suggestive of myocardial ischemia. This doesn't mean that T wave inversion in less than five leads are clinically insignificant. No, of course, you should respect them. You should have serial ECGs to detect whether there's dynamic change or not. And if the clinical presentation is suggestive, you need to arrange for invasive coronary angiography. Of course, the T wave inversion, as we mentioned, can be symmetrical or can be asymmetrical. Symmetrical, of course, is more and more clinically significant if it is more than five millimeter depths. In this case, we call it the deep symmetrical tube of inversion. So only tube of inversion more than one millimeter is just tube of inversion, but if it is more than five, it is called deep T wave inversion. Let's see this ECG example here. We have an evidence of symmetrical T wave inversion in the precordial leads, and here maybe less than five millimeters, so they are not considered to be deep, but they are clinically significant symmetrical T wave inversion, suggestive of myocardial ischemia, especially that they are symmetrical. Here in this ECG, we have deep symmetrical T wave inversion exceeding five millimeter. Of course, it seems familiar, the villain sign, which we are going to have a dedicated lecture for it after this. And of course, the deep symmetrical T wave inversion in the precordial lead is suggestive of subtotal or sub even total occlusion of the LAD and is very important to consider in the ECG. In this ECG example, we can see here that the T wave inversion seems to be asymmetrical as the descending limb is descending slowly and then the ascending limb ascending rapidly. But if you are in doubt and you cannot decide whether it is symmetrical or asymmetrical at the time, consider it as a worse, which is a symmetrical and you need to admit the patient, check serial ECG, check his cardiac markers to check whether it is suggestive of ongoing myocardial ischemia or just a strain pattern due to structural heart disease like left ventricular hypertrophy or cardiomyopathies. The biphasic T wave have two morphological variants, either starting positive and then turning negative or vice versa, and both are considered biphasic T wave whether starting positive or starting negative. Of course, here we can see in this example that the patient is having biphasic T wave in V2, 3, and 4, which are usually suggestive of ongoing myocardial ischemia if the patient is presenting with chest pain. And so, biphasic T wave are very important to recognize in ECG. Here in this ECG example, also we have biphasic T wave in V2, 3, and 4, and so they are suggestive also of ongoing myocardial ischemia.
and this ECG we have the vice versa pattern or the opposite pattern which is a biphasic T wave are starting negative and turning positive in V3 and V4 so biphasic T waves are very important and as clinically significant as the symmetrical T wave inversion let's now move to the transient ST elevation which is considered to be a part of the abnormal ECG features in non-ST because it is not considered to be STEMI it is just transient ST elevation. We know, of course, the transient ST elevation, it means that the ST segment resolves spontaneously, returning to the isoelectric line, not just partial resolution. Notice complete resolution with complete resolution of the chest pain. So patient is presented with typical chest pain, ST elevation, and when he is referred to another hospital for primary PCI, he became chest pain free, and so his repeat ECG shows no ST elevation. So usually it's diagnosed when the patient is transferred because we don't do follow-up ECG in patient with STEMI. Once the patient is having a C elevation ECG and chest pain, go to the cath lab or thrombolytic therapy. So for example, in this ECG, the patient was having ST elevations in inferior lead, and then they resolved completely to be in this ECG that there is no ST elevation in the inferior leads, and the patient has complete resolution of the chest pain. In the 2020 guidelines as well, the criteria for the transient ST segment elevation were ST elevation in two or more contiguous leads of one or more millimeter in all ECG leads or more than 2.5 millimeter in men less than 40 years, 2 millimeter in men more than 40 years or 1.5 millimeter in females. It seems the same cut of points in the definition of STEMI, but the difference here is that it is lasting less than 20 minutes with complete resolution of the ST segment. So the cutoff point is the same, but the duration and the resolution is the difference. The transient ST elevation is considered to be a high risk non-ST elevation catacoronal syndrome, and this patient needs early invasive strategy within less than 24 hours. Unless this transient ST elevation is recurrent and the patient is again and again having transient ST elevation and then resolving, he is considered to have a stuttering course of MI and he need to have urgent invasive. So if the patient has twice transient ST segment elevation, don't omit it and consider that this is just non-ST and I will arrange for coronary NG tomorrow. No, this patient need urgent because this vessel is nearly totally occluded and having a stuttering course before complete irreversible occlusion. So these clinical conditions, of course, are not considered transit ST elevation as we mentioned in the lecture before, improvement of ST elevation but with residual elevation, or the patient is still having persistent chest pain despite its segment elevation resolution, and this patient is considered as a STEMI and he needs primary PCI. So please to mention that the patient has transit ST elevation, ST segment should return to the isoelectric line, and the patient should have complete resolution of the chest pain. And remember, the MI classification of Q-wave and non-Q has been replaced by the STEMI and the non-STEMI because the pathological Q can occur in both STEMI and in non-STEMI and we mentioned this before. Pathological Q are not a sole feature for STEMI, can occur in non-STEMI as well and we are going to mention it in a dedicated lecture in the non-ST topic. And again and again and again, please, normal ECG in a patient with typical chest pain does not exclude MI up to 25% of patients with non-ST may have normal ECG on presentation and when you check their cardiac markers it is positive as the patient has non-STEMI with subtotal or total occlusion of a vessel so normal ECG does not exclude MI and so please a patient with typical chest pain and normal ECG don't discharge this patient this patient need admission and follow up his ECG and his cardiac markers so at the end of this introductory lecture to the non-ST, we understood today the value of ECG in non-ST acute coronary syndrome and the common ECG features, including the normal ECG, the ST segment depression, T wave changes, and the transient ST elevation. And our take home message today, normal ECG does not exclude MI. Comparison with previous ECG and serial ECG are of crucial importance in patients with ongoing ischemia if the clinical picture is not conclusive. ST depression carries a high risk prognosis in patients with non-ST and is considered to have the highest prognostic feature in non-ST. Thank you very much for your watching.